when we looked at this specifically, like what did Genghis Khan encounter? Who did he encounter? They were these smaller stature type beings that reminded us in the data a lot of the Wagas. Some civilizations apparently can protect themselves with technology that we don't understand, like these, these beings that the Mongolians encountered. The other people that were in the mine didn't see this, but he saw it. So these concentric rings open up, he's got a mine collapse happening, and he just starts moving through them. As he gets to the other side of these concentric rings opening up, there are these like two sort of gatekeepers. This treasure that's underground, all of these stories of treasure underground, and Wang Hu coming back with treasures. Like, how did he even find his way back? They must have showed him the way back. And like, when you get to that region, China, Tibet, you also get that vibrational frequency that leads to Shambhala, Shambhala as well. So now if a person wanted to go to one of these locations, one of the important things is that they themselves have to vibrate to the frequency of the location in order to be able to go to it. Interactions with inner earth beings and strange cave creatures have been documented for centuries, but so have interactions with people who are said to secretly live underground even today. What did Genghis Khan's Tartarian soldiers find when they encountered underground people? Where did missing miner Wang Hu disappear to in 2003 after a rock collapse? Are his bizarre medical miracles explained by the mighty Katans or Dones he claimed to have visited? Most importantly, was Gimli the Dwarf a reference to real humanoids in history? Journey with Metaphysical today through portals to otherworldly places. Join me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, and remote viewer John Vivanco for a show that's out of this world. And are you listening to the Metaphysical podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or elsewhere? Go ahead and just leave us that five-star rating and review. It's going to help us reach more people. And also, you have to remember to like, follow, and subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, Ganjing World, Twitter, and Facebook, wherever you are, so you won't miss one episode. John, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? Good. I'm excited about this episode because I think that most people at home don't really understand how crazy historically some of the stories coming out of China have been. It's hard to get stories out of China. It's it's like it's such a f foreign language because of the entirely separate system that they have with tones, the characters right. and all of this, you know, just it's it's just much harder to get that information, not to mention China being basically walled off since the 60s with, you know, the Great Cultural Revolution, you know, the CCP kind of being in charge over there. It's it's not easy to get cultural information and most of it has been destroyed. A lot of it has they've they've gone through great pains to destroy the the culture there. Yeah, so that's like uh today's episode is interesting from that standpoint because of the digging around this kind of stuff and you can still find threads of it but nobody actually ever focuses on this stuff and i think right. this is a really important area to focus on because when you start to actually again it's like you know what we we're talking about last episode a lot of people will just look at the little tips of on the surface but underneath there's all these connection points when you dig into it even deeper yeah and uh so for those of you at home who are listening right now we did uh, several episodes thus far on, I guess you could call them inner earth beings, cave systems that have had reports of beings and different things that we could find that have just created a lot of mystery for, for people throughout the years. We stumbled upon stories that were coming out of China that were so related and so different at the same time that we felt like a dedicated episode or two, however, however many episodes that it needs to take, we were just going to go through and talk about this stuff. And a lot of people don't understand how old China's culture is. It was like 500 AD. They were having their renaissance over there in the Tang Dynasty. And actually, some of the stories that we're going to tell you today coming out of the Tang Dynasty about people finding their way into the earth and, and the fantastic things that they found, you know, and then you've got things that were left over from prehistory. A lot of the emperors going through great pains to record ancient history and keep it recorded in certain books that are still there. And there's some weird, fairly weird things in, in there. Right. And then you've got the tons of pyramids 
pyramid type structures, the current government has blocked off from the rest of the world for the most part. So there's, there's a lot going on there. And I think that like goes way deeper than just pyramids. It does. And it's not just pyramids that they've blocked off any, any cultural evidence in the country of China that alludes to a deeper, more spiritual, like understanding of the world would get completely denied. Uh, not, not only to outsiders, but also within China as well, because it, if it's not sort of supporting this narrative that they have over there, that the, the, you know, the CCP is like your mother, basically. <laughs> you know how in the USSR, they called it Mother Russia, right? They called it that for a reason. They do. It's a similar thing over in China where it's like the, it's the CCP that birthed you almost. And right. it's this kind of warped um, mentality, you know, just can I only come about because of a, of a communist state. But not to get into the politics too much, but the, you know, it wasn't just China proper where some of these stories that we found came from. We have an account here from Genghis Khan and the Mongols that actually blew our mind. Okay, so the story goes that Genghis Khan and the Tartar people were trying to conquer an area of land, but a cloud blocked them many times from fighting. So when they searched the land, they found nobody. The soldiers searched and finally found just two people, which was a husband and a wife. And when the Tartars asked them where their people were, the couple said that they lived underground beneath mountains. Genghis Khan's soldiers managed to bring some underground people back to him and ask about their lands. And the book telling the story said, quote, Meanwhile, these men gathered by ways hidden beneath the earth and came against the Tartars to do battle and sprang up suddenly upon them and killed many, which sounds like the dwarves from Lord of the Rings, man. <laughs> they said they lived underground because people above ground were too noisy once a year with loud instruments and drums. I don't know, maybe some type of New Year's Eve or something. They can't seem to tolerate noise or bright sunlight, and their, their fighters, who are apparently great fighters, build systems underground and don't prefer sunlight. Right, right. I mean, here, you, here you're talking about something that go, it, it, it starts to go into s ancient uh, Native uh, American stories, kind of Native Indian stories in the United States. Um, that kind of reminds me of like, for instance, the Wagas. I don't know why. Um, I feel like there's there are tons of these stories around that don't get the time of day that are probably connected probably from earlier, earlier civilizations and a time when, I mean, think about it, like less people on the planet. Um, if I were living underground from and I'm some species that wasn't necessarily all human at this point in time, I'd be hiding like mad. I'd be going deeper into the earth and staying away from the surface as much as possible. Whereas maybe in the past that just didn't happen. But I think you find these stories all over the place. If you really dig, you really look. But a lot of native culture cultures, especially in the United States, don't want to share anymore because of the what archaeology and anthropology has done to their stories. Yeah, as soon as they share a story, you'll get these scientists over there searching for stuff, doing things, ruining the lands that they're trying to take care of. Are just changing you know, and basically just misinterpreting what right. they're saying. Yeah. And for those of you at home who just heard John mentioned the Wagas, we did an entire series on the Mount Shasta area that went through everything about Mount Shasta. The only thing left is for John and I to visit. Like we, we hit everything. And a part of that story was a really interesting group of, of people called the Wagas who lived, I guess you could say underground or even in the mountains that the native Americans over there had record of. And we went through this story. So I highly recommend you going back, watching those episodes. If you haven't, they will blow your ever loving mind. They blew ours. So what do you think the Mongols were encountering? That's it, right? You, you're getting a similar kind of like vibe to the race that was over there. Yeah. So it's like, it's like alien stuff, interdimensional stuff. Um, there's this sort of one bucket that we put everything in. We tend to at least, um, because we don't understand the phenomena and we don't understand 
how uh, these things are even connected to each other since they exist in a different realm. The, the, like, you know, the underground is, is the subconscious in a sense too, you know, it's the underworld. That's always an unknown for people. And so it's very difficult to like make heads or tails as far as like an explanation for all this goes. But in what we've seen with all this stuff is that there's, there are beings, there are things that are wholly different from each other that exist on this planet. And, and on top of that, you have layer upon layer upon layer of multi multiple dimensions. We like, we live in a multidimensional world and the whole underground thing is entrance and exits to the underworld, to other worlds. There are so many things going on and it's like, you can't put everything into one bucket. So when you get to these guys, when we looked at this specifically, like what did Genghis Khan encounter? Who did he encounter? They were these smaller stature type beings that reminded us in the data a lot of the Wagas out of the native, uh, native U.S. native people lore. They were a lot like that, and they were they were uh, living in a way that they had retreated to being underground um, in that region, in that specific area. Whereas, like in the United States, it seemed like they were more living on the surface in the mountains. Um, and so they were underground and they were literally trying to protect specific areas that they lived and they, they thought that they owned in a sense, and they didn't want any interlopers into it. When you look at these beings and you remote view them, they're like, they evolved here. So they evolved here over a period of time in a sense, like humans from a different age, from a different era. And then at a certain point, they, they like ascended to a different realm, to another realm, because you're talking about like a, a culture that is uh, pre kind of like pre pre our current time, human pre 12,000 years, they would have evolved back then. And then at a certain point, because they have gone into the underground zones, you get the different frequencies, they begin to understand and they have knowledge from the past on how to transcend out of this realm. So these particular beings that we were looking at with this, we don't necessarily see them around anymore. Um, they have gone like the way of the Wagas have gone. What's really weird is like while you were talking about that, I was I was thinking about this like the you were you were talking about them ascending, but sort of their the place that they go is 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 underground, you know. And that, and that they're smaller in stature, which almost sounds like these dwarves from, from Lord of the Rings kind of, right? It's almost right. like magical group. And they have a strange form of technology. I mean, think about it. They're using some type of cloud to completely ward off an entire, entire like Mongol army, right. which is like the right. most fierce army on the planet. Right. And then if the Mongols get past the cloud, they're popping out of the ground and taking them out. Right. These are the Mongols, man. The only guy I've heard really taking the Mongols out was like some crazy samurai named Kono Michari, you know, like which was a great story. But it's like, you know, most people would get would fall if the Mongol army approached. I mean, that's just how it was. The Mongol army was like the Rohan army in Lord of the Rings, where they were horse lords. They were on horse, which was like the most advanced you know, vehicle of the time and they would mow down armies. Right. right. And then you've got Graham Hancock in a previous episode uh, in this series, we're talking about Graham Hancock talking about these whistling dwarves and this pyramid that's named after these dwarves down there in, uh, in South America. And yeah, and then there's this correlation to the lands over in, in, I guess, the greater Mongolia area. I mean, who knows where that was? That could have been more European because the Mongols took over a massive amount of area. Just the correlation even between stuff that was in a, in previous episodes that we've discussed is really, really interesting, you know? We get into the underground thing and like we we will see these sort of like connections into other stories that we've looked at from other places on the earth, which kind of tells me that they come from the deep, they've been here for a long time and they have this sort of awareness of of really deep past history, not like the humans. And, and they also have understanding of technology, of ways to do things, as well as even have sort of mystical type 
abilities as well. Because if you're living underground, this is really a big thing about living underground. And you're a culture that lives underground, you're going to understand eventually the different types of frequencies that minerals and rocks put out. You absolutely are going to understand that. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why you see a lot of ghosts, Tommy knockers and whatnot around deposits of highly charged minerals, um, because they're portals, they're doorways to other realms. Um, and they're valuable, not just for us humans in the way they look and for trading, but energetically they're valuable. And so when you're living underground, I mean, this is stuff that's going to eventually come to these beings. So that's another aspect that we see, right? It's like, it's crazy. In that episode where we were talking about the, I guess you could call it the mineral, the crystal mine. When you guys were remote viewing it, you're seeing this like strange Gandalfian wizard who's like controlling some of the energy off of those things. Right. 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 And it's like, we just, we just, we live in a we very don't strange. No, we just don't know. We, we were, <laughs> we're like, <clears throat> we're sandwiched between these other dimensions. <clears throat> we're sandwiched within the multiverse. These types of beings that will manage these portals, right? Not all portals. Some portals are like human created. Like you can create a dark portal in your home if you wanted to, where you have lower by eating, astral. By eating and, a lot of chili. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a you dark can definitely portal. do that. That's a dark, dark portal. <laughs> so you can, you can create light portals as well, based off of your intention, where you create this sort of place where um, lower astral, higher astral can have more of an influence and come through. When you get to the ones that are more set, that have been there for a very long time, that have to do with these frequencies and energies, you usually have something like an administrator of it, which seems to be every single time we've looked at some of these things, it's like you get this wizard thing. I, you know, the language is so weird with remote viewing data. When remote viewers use a specific type of language on something, like calling something a wizard, it means something important because you don't see that in other data. Right. So there is something because the wizard, if you, you know, go into the idea concept around the wizard showing up, it would be some someone who is very in tune with creating magic or manipulating energy to create magical things to humans in a sense. And so there's a aspect of manipulation to it by these beings. And that's why they would be wizardy in this in this whole construct. So we need a t-shirt that says wizardy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, remote viewers make up their own words actually, well, because I, I it's mean, like you, you can't find the words to describe things. So you just make up words. to. Well, describe. And it, it makes sense, right? Like you're seeing these things in your mind's eye, you're going through them and you're like, I don't have any other way to describe this other than saying it's like a wizard. We'll get into this a little bit more, but what also is blowing my mind about this is this idea that these creatures descended, but ascended. And it goes back to, well, what does that actually mean about certain parts of the earth and what minerals are there and how those are being used as portals to take you to a different place? And by the end right. of this episode, you're going to be turned upside down. I'm telling you that right now. Right. Because well, you know, OK, so we think of how many like how many times have we talked and we're talking about. Well, what a, this 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 uh, hole in the ground is a portal to hell. It's it's the entry to the underworld. Okay, so I think you have to first separate underworld from hell because underworld really like when, especially when you get into the older literature. When you get into now, like it, more or less the, the world we live in, we think of underworld as being the dark hellish realm, which is not necessarily the case. The underworld is more about the subconscious, the unknown. The unknown is not the evil realm, right? There's a difference there. And that has always been a, a separation throughout earlier history. The underworld is something to explore. The underworld is full of uh, information and knowledge that can help you in your own world. The hell realm is a totally different thing. Now, you can find portals to hell, absolutely, to hell realms. You can bring those into your own life if you want to do that. But going into the underworld is a little bit different than going into the portal to hell. 
you might guys might think that these stories are only ancient stories. But John sent me an article a couple of weeks ago that totally blew my mind. This is a story from February 2003. A rock collapse occurred at a mine near Jishi City in Heilutsu, Jiang Province. The mine owner initially denied the disaster, but after relatives of the miners appealed to the authorities, he was forced to admit that 14 miners were actually missing. Only 12 of these bodies were found. The mine was closed. The owner received a long prison sentence and compensation was awarded to the families of the dead and missing. All right, now check this out. Five years later, one of the two missing bodies that they could not recover, Wang Hu, returned home, but no one was waiting for him. During his time, many things had changed. His wife had remarried. His older children moved away. He basically accepted everything, tried to move on with his life. The authorities were complaining because a lot of his relatives were being given compensation for his death, the insurance and all of that stuff. So this guy just decides he's going to start trying to pay this stuff off himself, right? This question arises through this whole debacle. Why Wang Hu had not reported himself earlier during those five years, right? Now, just to kind of give you a little bit of a backstory, there's a cave-in in the mine, there's basically rocks fall in, okay? A bunch of people die, and two men were not able to be recovered. So two bodies were not recovered, all right? And they couldn't go in there to get them because the cave-in was too, it would have taken, it was just too dangerous to try to get in there and to get them. Wang Hu, after he's asked, you know, why he had not reported himself earlier, he stated that he was willing to fully repay the compensation paid, and then he explained that he had been living among the mighty Catan people who inhabited the depths of the earth all these years. He was sent to the hospital for medical examination. The doctors concluded that Wang Hu was, complete, was completely healthy, both physically and mentally, and his account of his years spent had to have been a fiction. However, the doctors could not explain something. They could not explain where the miner had actually been all of this time and why he showed no signs of anthracosis, which is a lung disease common to miners. Wang Hu had previously contracted this disease five years earlier and had to leave his job at the mine to avoid becoming totally disabled. However, he now had no signs of the disease. And in addition, he appeared to have, this is really freaking weird. All right, I'm just gonna say that right here he appeared to have more teeth than before 32 instead of 25 wong whose physical age corresponded to 26 years old to 28 years old although he was actually 39 so when they're looking at his body they're like your body is the body of a 28 year old 25 year old whatever Okay, now most people do have 32 teeth, of course, but he'd been missing some. So where did they, these five other teeth grow back? Right. Because, right? you know, in China, it's not like dental, you know, you don't have the, you might not have the best teeth, depending on what you've been doing, how many cigarettes you've been smoking. Lots of people in China smoke. It's, you know, so how did he grow these teeth back, right? This, so the mine collapsed in 2003. Is that what it was? And then he came back and, and then he reappeared in 2008. So this is this is a modern story, you guys. So this is a modern story. Like this is a rare story to find. It's really rare. Sorry, seven teeth, not five. My bad. My uh my my podcast math is 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 no good. <laughs> Actually, my real life math is no good either. So don't trust me there either. Yeah, I've got really poor counting skills myself. The question really is, after you come out of this story, you're like, cool, cool story, bro. Who are the mighty Catan people? What is that? Who was he living with? And then how is his health better than it was before? Or was he just making this whole thing up? Because or was he, he just, you know, his family's feeding him money under the surface or something, you know? Yeah, Let me but... just pretend like I'm dead true but it doesn't explain his his greatly improved health his reappearing teeth if that's true right and he was he seemed to be in a good state like he was even willing to pay off this debt you know from all these people that benefited from his death well what do i think so yeah we looked at we had to look at this one i mean come on guy disappears for five years where was he 
what was he doing in that five years? How did he disappear? Right. So we, we looked at all these different things, what they're mining for, what they were mining for has a lot to do with a specific frequency. Okay. So now they're, they're mining, they're in this cave system, they're, they're digging, they're mining, this collapse happens. Um, there's, there's a lot of compression of rock. There's a lot of energy showing up in the data. And during the collapse, it could be the rock striking each other, the further compression of certain minerals, these, cons- these sort of light rings, concentric rings show up like the other people, he must've been separated from them. The other people that were in the mine didn't see this, but he saw it. So these concentric rings open up, he's got a mine collapse happening and he just starts moving through them. As he gets to the other side of these concentric rings opening up, there are these like two sort of gatekeepers that look similar to each other. And, and he passes through that and he gets to this place where it's like open sky, a sand desert. It's kind of dry. There are like, like areas of, of greenery here and there, but it's, it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty dry area. He, like he's moving through this area. He's walking. It's like, he's walking a lot, walking through this landscape. He comes across this location. Eventually it's described as this sort of temple castle kind of thing. He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know what the heck's going on. These beings show up. Now this would be what are called the mighty Catan. They show up. They're highly spiritual. They are very thin. They've got big ears. They look like elves. They look like the Hopkinsville type beings, except these, this rendition of these are way more spiritual, way more mystical of another dimensional realm. And in the data also talking about it being another planet. These beings basically are channelers of like universe energy. They collect energies in and they channel it out through themselves. And so his time was spent with these beings in that realm, in that that whole event for him might not have lasted five years. It might have been a totally different time. Time dilation occurs in these things as well. But the specific reason why this occurred right there and was an opening for him to go through, and any one of them could have gone through it, was literally because of the specific type of mineral in the rock. That's why they're they're there in a sense. Like they're there, but they're not there. They are there, but in a different realm, in a different world, but like another planet. And even like, it's so weird. It's like, you think about this, it's like the, the notion of like Aldebaran came up during some of the sessions, right? And so you wonder, it's like, when we look at planets, sometimes we don't see anything in the third dimensional realm, but we see things in a different dimensional realm. Like when we look at Venus, for instance, oftentimes when we look at Venus, we want to look at something on the surface, we slide right through into another dimension. And it's almost like you can't stop it because that's where the pull is. And so like when we were looking at, at this particular thing, it was like a different dimensional realm, but on another planet. And the gateway was through the frequency of the minerals in the rocks that they were mining and the collapsed caused the thing to just open up for a moment. And these, these Catans, very similar, very similar to the Hopkinsville type beings and the goblins in in the stature, in the way they look, but like this other sort of rendition of it, right? This, this like higher frequency rendition. So it's almost like you have like, you know, you you had like in our data, the Hopkinsville um, goblins were in a ship going through a portal when they had their disaster, right? In this Chinese story, he goes through a portal and goes to a place where these very similar looking beings are but they are even more spiritually advanced than these. And then you have the, the, the three-toed one, the photographs that David Christie took in the Hellier episodes, and those are even more devolved from this. So like 
you have like what appears to be under the surface, this sort of like evolution potentially, you know, I'm just like, I'm speculating on some of this, but seeing the connections within the data and you have this potential like evolutionary, like expanse of another species, perhaps like humans. Like if you think about humans and the evolutionary process that humans go through and how, you know, you get into people talking about this psychically and channeling and whatever, that humans evolve into different realms and become more technologically sophisticated and spiritually sophisticated. And in a sense, it's kind of like, what if there's this, the, the, these types of beings, these creatures who are in that process, but are just under the surface for us, just under our feet, both in our realm and moving into another realm of evolution? really curious thing but that's the that was the mighty Catan. that was the mighty Catan people who could be the hopkinsville goblins that's crazy yeah or it's like crazy, some right? type of or some i guess you could even say like some version or some type of being that did not <laughs> devolve into whatever the goblins became with the way they describe how the orcs or the goblins came about in lord of the rings was well, the orcs were once elves, right? They were once elves and then dark forces took them, tortured them and changed them into these orc things, right? Over a long period of time, the heightened version of them is the actual elves, which, you know, look how different they could be. You right. know, if, if like when you like that, they're like evil incarnate. <laughs> right, right. The, the orcs, I mean, you know, there are other places where it's almost like it appears like this happens in nature. Like if you look at, for instance, two birds that always seem to be like similar, but at odds with one another is like the eagle, like this majestic, beautiful bird. And then if you look at the vulture alongside it, it's like a dark, putrid version of an eagle. They're about the same size, you know, and it's just twisted itself over time into this thing that feeds on death. You know, even the movements changed over time and like they became this like long neck like. Yeah, I'm not saying that that it is it is the Hopkinsville uh, goblins or related to that. I'm saying that we have right. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm presenting it more as an idea based off of data points that they could be something like what you're saying or in some type of evolutionary process throughout dimensions, like seeding dimensions. It's kind of like if you think if you think in terms of humans as as evolving from like Muddy the Mud Skipper or something and turning into cavemen and then turning into this, it would be something like similar to that. If you believe in that kind of process, <laughs> Who the hell which I don't the mud skipper, dude. <laughs> like I need I need some kind of graphic of this, like on a T-shirt. Yeah, we need Muddy the Mud Skipper. There he is. Muddy the Mud Skipper. <laughs> Pre-human. Pre that was the pre yeah. beginning of human According, being. According to the theory of evolution, of course. Right, right. Okay, so, you know, this guy Wang Hu we were talking about who, who appears after five years, you know, he doesn't bat an eye on, on paying off, like, all of these debts. Evidence of some increase in moral character, potentially, but... But there was also a part of this story that I thought was really interesting, and actually, it connects to some other stories that we've shared strangely in this series. It was revealed basically that Wang Hu had sold uncut emeralds to a jeweler in Shanghai, which was confirmed by his testimony and verified by intelligence agencies. And when asked where he obtained them, Wang Hu said he found them while staying with the mighty Catan. Basically, he's come back. So there's this basically this treasure underground and it's emeralds, which are, you know, this beautiful green gem. We've got this strange thing where we've got, you know, the Groot Slung who is underground protecting, uh, you know, reportedly, allegedly this treasure that's underground. All of these stories of treasure underground and Wang Hu coming back with treasures from the underworld or some other dimension that he came back from. Like, how did he even find his way back? They must have showed him the way back. What do you yeah, think? We, about didn't, we didn't, we didn't see about how we didn't see how he came back. Did not see. He, he would have had to come back through another portal, like outside into another cave system or something. What's interesting. And, you know, we've gone into this in other episodes. You always have this sort of like 
paraphysical presence that lingers around treasures, like in mines and stuff like that. And that, you know, the whole Tommy Knocker thing. And you have beings who are interested in helping people get a hold of those treasures. You have beings that are there to protect it for themselves. And all these treasures are more like um, on, a, on a base level, they're an energetic frequency. And when you get into these, these beings who are multidimensional, it's more about the energetic frequency of this whatever it is that does something for them that they find valuable because the actual physical characteristics of it might be absolutely useless to them. And so there's a protection of a frequency is what we've seen. They're, they're protecting a frequency that they feel they need for whatever reason. And so you get the paranormal phenomena happening around it. You get the protection of dragons on it. You get it being used in general by underground civilizations to pass, move in and out one place to another, you know, you've got, you've got, you know, we see this idea with cryptids where it's like, well, a lot of the reason why people don't see these things is because of that aspect, because a lot of them will live in cave systems and move into other realms into the upside down and back. And it's what Montauk and Philadelphia experiment and other military government experiments have been trying to explore and have explored and map to, to use. All of these things are related. They're all connected. They're not separate from each other. I can guarantee you that 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 in these projects, dark projects, black projects and programs exploring this, they've run into the probably very similar, if not the same types of beings that are spoken about in some of these stories. Yeah, when they can find them, because if they're some civilizations apparently can protect themselves with technology that we don't understand, like these these beings that the Mongolians encountered. Now, like when we get to the Wang Hu, it didn't seem like it was like the Shambhala, right? It didn't seem like it was Shambhala. It was because we've viewed that before. That's like this, like a heavenly realm. This was like a realm that was of these beings that were not necessarily connected to that. So we have different things. And like when you get to that region, China, Tibet, you also get that vibrational frequency that leads to Shambhala, Shambhala as well. Um, and okay. So now if a person wanted to go to one of these locations, one of the important things is that they themselves have to vibrate to the frequency of the location in order to be able to go to it. There has to be something about them that vibrates to that frequency. And that's a, also a doorway that can get, get them in. So the question is for everybody at home, is there evidence of this heavenly realm that you can, you can find your way to? by delving underground. Well, there is, and we're going to show you in the next episode. So definitely stick around. Uh, this has been a really awesome episode. We don't have enough time to get into the other accounts, but we will get into those into the, into the next episode, and it will knock your socks off with the evidence we found that corroborates Wang Hu's story of finding the mighty Catan people. So stick around. And John, thanks so much for being with us. And for those of you at home, we hope you thought this episode was as out of this world as we did.